So you heard me talk about community a bunch, um, but I'll use these two minutes to talk about what I do during the day. I work at a software company called Glitch. Uh, Glitch is based in New York City. We are a platform for building web applications in the browser. So instead of a uh, text editor pushing to Git or GitHub, deploying your code, you can just go to glitch.com and do all of it in the browser and it happens automatically. And my title is developer advocate. So my job is to build community around the people who are building apps on this platform. And it's a pretty open-ended platform. It's not geo-specific, although you can use it for map things. And I know several folks here have and do do that. Um, but the challenge is how do you take a group of people who are all doing seemingly different things and bring them together as a community? The community building aspect of my job is informed a lot by my experience with map time, but also in general, geospatial communities are pretty amazing. And there's like a, sh a shared common interest, but I think more than that, it's um, being empathetic with each other about our like shared journey and vision. And hopefully some of that energy can be injected into the general programming community beyond just geo. Cool. Thanks. Amazing. Great. And? Cool. OK, well, part of the question that I read before I came was defining what a community is. Yeah. And that got me thinking that, like, with community, you start off with it's about relationship building. So that's the really important thing. And relationships are built by repetition and connection. So I think with my role at CBA as chair and part of what we do as an industry body is really thinking about how we can facilitate that community and help create an identity. And with identity usually comes a common purpose. So that's why this conference is so awesome because everyone here is drawn by the common purpose and kind of the values around openness. Um, and then the connection around that, I think there is a lot that you can do online, but that relationship, a lot of it has got to happen in person. And especially in the last 10 to 15 years, now that the world's gone more and more digital, um, we've never had this rate of change as a species. And our relationships have changed. So I think it's just really important to be aware of that and really, really conscious that we need to design these connections and help keep it healthy and look after each other. And yeah, I think it's really, really broad what yeah community means to me or what it entails. Yeah, and then as my role at Coordinates and what we do as a company, um, I was talking to David Garcia beforehand because he's done a huge amount with community building as well. Um, and everyone here is obviously involved and really active in communities because you're here. Um, yeah, it just made me think like how I've been involved and connected with so many people through events like this. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'll pass it on. <laughs> Good. Good morning, all. My, uh, my name is Bart Nellethauer. I come from Brussels, Belgium, which is sort of an hour away from here. <laughs> in my mind. Um, thank you for the introduction uh, earlier on on the OGC, the Open Geospatial, I should say consortium, but maybe community. I think we need to change name here. Would, uh, <laughs> would be a good thing. Um, community in the OGC is all around uh, the ability to share geospatial data. Um, so through the use of, of standards. And a standard is, well, when a community gets together and agree to do something in a certain way. Um, and sort of that gives us in the OGC a warm and fuzzy feeling inside. I think that's, that's important, you know, trying not to repeat what the previous speaker said, which was all true. Um, but I think, you know, what drives me is really is to create that, making other people successful. And I believe that defines a community is getting that, you feel it in your stomach when you're doing something right. You also get that same feeling when you don't do something right, uh, or a different feeling. Um, and so I think that's what most people that come to the OGC as a community, and there's a lot of overlap in, in the communities, uh, get that warm and fuzzy feeling in your stomach as, as you do the right thing. 
Um, I, I guess for me, uh, community is about, um, it, it's like building a home. You're, you're, you're creating a space for, for yourself um, to grow into. Um, and so for me, um, being involved in this community has always been about, like it's quite personal, I guess. Um, uh, just creating the, co the conditions uh, for myself and for people like me to, to, to thrive in professionally and personally. And so um, when I think about um, building a community, uh, particularly around organizing this conference, I guess. It's, it's about creating those conditions where people can come together. And a lot of stuff happens spontaneously uh, when you bring this many people together and all these great brains, um, building relationships and so on. But um, a lot of stuff doesn't happen spontaneously either. So for me, it's about doing the work to pull people together, create the conditions um, for this kind of stuff to happen. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. We have a couple of questions up here first, which I think I might point at you, John. Uh, one question is, how do we avoid complete breakdown of communities due to a lack of turnover of people in organizing roles who get burnt out? John? Yeah, uh, great question. I don't but know. Just, can I just talk to the <laughs> second one, which is that um, I've found that many of most communities fail after the last founding member leaves. What are your thoughts on successfully passing it on to others? So continuity, burnout. Um, yeah, I mean, Edwin, referred to that in his talk yesterday when he was talking about some stuff that he was heavily involved in in the Pacific and after he left it didn't carry on I think that um, yeah it's a real danger I don't know I mean um, from my point of view it's about um, I mean bringing people together empowering them and um, being empowered by them as well but um, I, I mean it's a difficult question answer I don't know the answer I hope that we're not going to suffer from that in this community I think we have a real opportunity to, to form a critical mass where that's less likely to happen in the short term. Um, it feels like we're headed in the right direction, but yeah. Maybe, and maybe Lizzie, about um, when the founders leave. Um, there's a concept called uh, concentric circles of community, where at the center you have your diehard labor of love, your John Bryant's, you know, the, the people who are, will be there, want to be there, and want to do everything. And then there are rings around that of people with various levels of interest, excitement, and time. And one of the ways that you can kind of prevent this from happening, especially when founders leave, is by um, enabling and encouraging small ways for people to get involved. It doesn't have to be, hey, come be a decision maker on our executive panel, but it can be, hey, will you organize the lightning talks? Hey, will you um, make sure that we have food for our next event? Um, will you send out an email ahead of time so people know what's going on? And be able to be clear and communicative, but also distribute that work beyond. Um, and a lot of times when, when a founder leaves, um, like in our situation, we were doing so much of the work and we're hiding so much of it away so that it felt easier for other people to start chapters and, and do what they wanted to do. Um, when in reality, honesty and being clear about the kind of work it takes and asking for help earlier um, can be really beneficial to um, getting to, to community longevity. Um, and there are champions out there. There are people out there who are very, very excited about the thing that you're doing. They won't necessarily raise their hand and say it. Um, and part of the job of the organizer, in addition to organizing, is to like learn about your community and know what people are good at and what how you can like harness their energy. That sounds creepy, but like <laughs> you know how you can positively in a positive way harness their energy to get them involved in a way that is sustainable. But easier to say than to do. But. Yeah, I guess I would just add like succession planning, sort of like uh, you want to be able to identify some key people, make sure they've got some autonomy and some role that's critical to the organisation well in advance, right when you start, so that when someone is thinking about their term and really have a plan, and you can adjust that plan, of course, but yeah, to set with the outset, just be like, I've got three years to do this. These people seem to be kind of keen, um, get them all involved and autonomous, and then you've got a really good position to actually let go, and then they can like take it forward into the future in their new thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that's a good segue to Bart actually here. So, I mean, I, I think of OGC as as a community of communities. I recently joined up to um, one of the uh, the groups, and I got instantly about twenty different mailing lists of different communities doing different kind of chatter. I had to turn them all up. So, so my point is that there's lots of different groups doing lots of different things, and so maybe how much how much top down control is there, and how much is it organic and self organising, and I mean. Where's that balance between letting things happen and, and making sure that they're done similarly? Okay. Can I, I'm, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to still reply to the previous one as I put an ampersand between that question. Sure. Put that into the background. Um, it's on the previous one is uh, I'm a 55-year-old dad, and I think I managed my smallest community together with my wife, and that's the kids, and, and is, is letting go. So I mean, our philosophy in educating our kids is letting go a little bit more every day. Mm. Community should not be about an individual or a parent. It should be about raising that community, raising the kids, and letting them yeah. you know, do the same thing or make the same mistakes again, I guess. <laughs> <It's about laughs> and it's good making mistakes. Lizzie, what you said, you know, making mistakes and learning from them. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Good. Communities of communities and how much does... So you, you're, I think you're referring to as OGC staff. So we're... OGC is 25 years old this year. It's, we, we had a big party in our non-existing virtual offices, so we all bought a cake. <laughs> 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 and ate it at home. <laughs> So there's no OGC office, so we all work from the home office. And that was in August. And um, um, there, is, uh, there isn't a whole lot of staff steering as such, as the community is, is relatively mature, although there, what you said is, is the, the technology changes, community change every day. And so you have to be, you have to be aware of that. Um, so... Uh, maybe a bit of a dull answer is is the OGC has very well written down policies and procedures and and that sort of is what we we use and uh, we're the, the work that we do is is consensus based so we all tend to agree on how to do things and and there is a lot of talking yeah. and trying to agree yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes, that's the, by the way, the most difficult thing in the OGC is not so much the, the technical work that we do, is just getting folks to agree on something. And, you know, actually, no, that's, that's the second hardest bit. The most, or the hardest bit is just getting them into a room yeah. through the same door. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, we all have our user manual. Yeah. It's unpublished. And, and you sort of get to know that. Um, really, and... and I think the, the success of the OGC is is uh, is getting is not so much the standards and and maybe I'm I'm swearing in church here. I don't think open source is the answer to everything. It's an enabler, <laughs> <laughs> just like open standards is just an enabler. It's we need to solve real world problems, and rarely you see that a single community solves all the the world problems. So it's getting the communities of communities together. Yeah, and and so that's when you join. You get you know the yeah. too many lists. I need to make note of that. Um, is getting communities to work together, yeah. and and is that a community of technology in a domain? I don't know, but it's it's, it's yeah. Yeah, and I think we um, we've experienced a lot of what you talk about there ourselves. I mean, we have the OpenStreetMap and the Phos4G communities here, but there's also the the smaller communities in that. And I've got to say, some of the conversations about how to run these conferences and how we should, what we should do. Some of the conversations do feel like they go on for a really long time and, and the outcomes may be different than what I would have liked, but it feels like a robust decision by the time we got to the end of it and it feels really good. Can I make an additional personal note? Yeah. Um, so I said I live in Belgium. We have our first female prime minister, uh, which is, shouldn't be a special thing. <laughs> uh, the first question they asked her was, how do you manage your family? <laughs> I, I sank through the ground. That should not be the first question. So therefore, I want to mention my kids just like, sh you know, yeah. apparently that yeah. A, yeah. a reporter's question should, is it because she was female that they asked that question? I was ashamed for the yeah. reporter. So. Well, um, 
Uh, I'll refrain from making a comment myself, but there's, I've got an interesting thing to talk about to you later. Um, let's... <laughs> a positive thing. Oh, look, I'll, look, I'll go over. So Denise McKenzie, so she's in the OGC as well, and her LinkedIn has, as one of her roles, mother. And I, I've never seen a male with one of their LinkedIn roles as being father, and we should. Well, not mother, but that's father, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I thought it was great. Um, I'm going to segue here to the top question, which is not even a segue, it's very natural. Could each of you speak to how diversity should be addressed when building new communities and managing existing ones? So would, would someone like to sort of start? Have you ever had the experience of being so sure of yourself after a really long, hard mental battle and you're like ready to go and then somebody walks in and says like, did you think about this one thing that you totally forgot? It takes a lot of courage and self-awareness in that moment to say, you are right, we do need to untangle this and rebuild it together. Uh, communities are historically very bad at this. Um, in the United States, there's uh, a, an org there was a movement for the Women's March after uh, What's-His-Face got elected. and. Um, <laughs> that organization was um, run by a group of women who were all, they all looked the same. And as women of color started to come up to that community and say like, we are not represented, um, there was an immediate pushback. It was like, this is a really hard thing and we're doing our best, so step off, we're gonna do it our way. And it ended up alienating and excluding a huge group of people who have been historically part of those movements. So really, the, I think that the answer is uh, humility. You have to be able to say, you are right. I, I have all of these ideas, but they only come from my brain and my experience or the experience of organizers. And we need to have different ideas in the room, even if they contradict long-held beliefs. Um, it's important to be able to interrogate our own uh, thought process and decision making. Most people are not very good at that. It requires active work. We're taught that you know, you to be to be successful, you need to be an expert. You need to be right. You need to um, have answers to all the questions. And it's a lot more beneficial in the long run to have a brief awkward moment of we disagree. Let's talk it out. Come up with a solution and move forward. And in terms of diverse communities, this is a matter of recognizing that there are a lot of voices that don't get the same natural amplification as others. Um, and that's everything from age to background to socioeconomic status to um, introversion, extroversion, right? There are people who take up a lot of space in a room, myself, because I like to talk. And then there are people who are quieter but have great ideas. And as an organizer, it's your job to encourage that explicitly and overtly and a lot, uh, more than, than you think you should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, um, yeah, I really like the way you phrased it about making sure people have a voice because often especially if you're the only if you feel like the outsider and you've got this really strong group and you're coming in you don't push forward and make your voice heard and the other danger is when other people speak for the minority and it's about and I think you have to be really conscious of making a space for other people's voices to be heard and not speak for them um yeah, so I think that's one key step with diversity. And you, actually, you really have to think about it and to look around the room and be like, okay, who's missing from this conversation? How can we get them included? And I think that's where community building is really important because you're like, how do you make this a welcoming, awesome community that the people who aren't here are like, I want to be part of it. And how do you welcome them in and make sure that they have their voices? So I think those are the key things that I think of with diversity. Hou er rekening mee dat niet iedereen Engels spreekt. So what I said, this, this is, you know, not everyone speaks English natively in a community. So I think most of you here are native English speakers. Pardon who, my ignorance. Who's, who's not um, native English? Oh, good, you see. And, and so take that into account. Sometimes um, 
the English language is not always as simple. I'm a uh, native Dutch, French kind of English, I don't know. Uh, but take that into account when uh, when you built your community. Uh, yeah, just that, and I just spoke Dutch to you. Yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, one thing that I one remark I would make is that um, I think uh, at the one, one of the founding ethos of of this community of the open geospatial community and open communities in general is um, uh, embracing a diversity of viewpoints, um, and that comes from a diversity of backgrounds. And I think that w what I would really like to see, and I think what most people in this community would like to see, is that we um, fully embrace being a compassionate community and, and bringing in a diversity of people that um, represents the entirety of the community. So that means um, in the context of organizing a conference, that means doing things like a travel grant program and mm. uh, making sure that we pull the levers that we can pull to, to bring in people that may not feel comfortable putting in talk submissions and so on. Yeah. Um, encouraging, uh, tapping people on the shoulder and, and trying to bring them in. Um, yeah. We have there, there's you know some things that there, there are a few things we can do, and I think it, it's up to us to do that. And that, that um, yeah. Anyway, it, it's it's really great to see people c coming from other countries, uh, sharing their stories, and I think it enriches us all. So, yeah. Well, you've got the microphone there. Um, what community feedback, John, has there been on what isn't working for people within Phosphor G, Map, Oceania, within our community? Is there somewhere that we're failing, do you think, that you're willing to admit to the audience here? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a really good question. I mean, I think um, <clears throat> w one thing that we could be doing better, um, that we're trying to do, I mean, I feel, I feel like it's been, the process has been a little bit scrambly at times. We're really busy, we're trying to get things done, and sometimes we end up going underground a little bit because we're like, okay, we just gotta get this thing done, but... Um, we, we have a public mailing list. We try to do a lot of stuff on the public mailing list. Um, not everybody's comfortable writing on public mailing lists. So communication can actually be pretty difficult because you know, we're talking about trying to find ways where people feel comfortable expressing themselves. Um, and if some people aren't comfortable posting a public mailing list, let us go quiet. We need their input too. So I mean, I think we could be doing better at figuring out how to communicate. I don't think there are any easy answers. Um, we have a Slack channel that's open to the public. People can join it and join the conversation. Some people don't use Slack. Mm. Um, some people are fed up with mailing lists because they feel like they're from the 1990s. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer, but I think that's something that we, I'd really like to see us as a community figure out over the next couple of years. What can we be doing better? Communication. Yeah. Because we need to, you're talking about burnout, you know, if you're, if you're um, not communicating with people, people aren't hearing yeah. what's going on. They're not going to step up. They're not going to join in, um, and so by communicating more broadly, we can people can be aware of what's happening. They can put up their hand and say, "Oh, I'm interested in doing that thing. I want to help you with that thing." But it's one of the beauties of being open is that it's easy to communicate. I mean, in our work, we do a lot of our development in the open, which just it feels good. It feels good being able to be open and share like that. So it's, it's why we're all here, right? Um, so maybe one for Anne. What steps can public and private employers take to foster employee involvement in communities? From a SEBA perspective, maybe encouraging businesses to encourage their employees to get amongst it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what can businesses do? Well, I think using open standards is a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start there because I feel if businesses are using open standards, it means that they're, create, they're fostering a business community. So they're saying, we're doing this piece really well and we want it to talk to your businesses. So I feel that's one part of it is not staying internal or not trying to grow and grow and grow to do many, many things, so doing your one piece well, mm. openly, so that's one part. Um, I think supporting your employees to attend and engage with outside your business as well is really important. Um, 
using tools and platforms and being encouraging and having like foster an environment where people feel comfortable to speak their truths to be able to work with sort of forgiveness not permission like that you're not really really risk averse so that you can feel confident to um, make mistakes and then move on to the next thing and keep trying and failing and trying and failing and yeah so I think fostering those kind of really comfortable environments is how yeah. businesses can help their employees Great. And I think that helps make people feel really autonomous and engaged in what they're doing as well yeah would anybody else like to comment on that one? It's really tempting um, when working with your employer and trying to say, I want to go to this event. They want to say, what's the return on the investment? What am I going to get back from this? And uh, fortunately slash unfortunately, um, they want a quantitative metric when reality is is the impact is qualitative. You, uh, It's hard to put a number on impact and uh, what that like portends for the future. So um, yeah, it's uh, like kind of instilling that idea that like even if we don't have a specific number of like actual dollars that are coming back from it, it's about like what that perpetuates and allows to happen in the future. Has IGC done quantitative analyses of the value of open? Yes, we have. Um, or we, we referenced material that was out there. Um, so yes, that, that there, there's a lot of yeah. quantitative numbers that, that don't try to reinvent the warm wheel. Um, as I said, my definition for a standard is you know just agreeing to do something in a similar way. Mm. Don't put too much red tape on it. And therefore, it doesn't need to be reinvented, and that's saved hours mm. and integration time and whatnot. Yeah. C can I, I proactively can I practically take Of course, a yeah, jump on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is an interesting one. Is spatial special? Yep. Um, no, spatial should not be special. Uh, we shouldn't be having this conference. It should, you know, FOS4 geospatial. Uh, is there a FOS4 integer, or is there a FOS4 float, or is there a FOS4 <laughs> varchar2, <laughs> or a FOS4 blob? Uh, but we have, and, and, uh, and, and therefore, we need to recognize it. So, uh, so spatial should not be special, but we need to recognize the complexity. Mm. Um, and I referred to a recent event, not last week, but five years ago, where W3C and the OGC came together. And we sort of found each other. There was, was a graphic up that says, Mrs. Globe meet Mr. Cube. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was a good one. Um, so the web discovered spatial, X, Y. In best of cases, X, Y, Z, or Z. Z or Z here? Z, Z X, Y, Z. Um, and geospatial sort of discovered the new web or how the web now does things, so mm. open API and so. Mm. And I thought that was special. And, you know, well, the, the, just getting the two communities and you know doing it the, the right way the the web spatial and then we on the on the website so I, you know spatial should not be special but recognizing the complexity so I think that that's a great opener for this community is how can we enable the ICT world with with spatial or geospatial and I think there's there's huge markets and and define what markets mean for yourself yeah in enabling that and and that starts from the beginner. I I, uh, I just sent a tweet to my own, well, not a tweet, but a Slack message to my own team is how do we cater for beginners on the geospatial side? Yeah. So the, the other half of the question is around different dynamics compared to other tech communities. Is there, is there something in there as well? Me? Lizzie? I, so I, my, um, <laughs> my, my canned question was around how you write about geodesy for Mapbox. Oh, um, yeah. So geodesy is special, as we all know. Special math. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, uh, Mapbox, so I worked at a, a company called Mapbox for four years, um, and I'm sure some of you are familiar. Um, Mapbox builds tools for adding maps to web and mobile applications. And a lot of the people who work at Mapbox are not map people. They came into 
their software engineers or web developers um, who came in and realized that maps are cool or they wanted a job, whatever. Some of them don't even care about maps. Um, but questions would come up that were like very specific to geospatial knowledge. Um, particularly the one I think that you're referencing is particularly like how do we store, what projection and coordinate system do we store data in versus displaying data? Um, what, is, what does it mean when our maps are constrained to being displayed in spherical mercator versus any other projection? Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of, there has been in the past, I think less so now, a lot of tension in that industry between people who um, are programmers and don't want to think about map projections at all, and then people who have a long history or experience of having learned about um, projections and datums and coordinate systems and feel that their geospatial knowledge sits on top of that experience and that it's, you know, special, uh, which it is. Um, but the kind of the other side of that is that programmers also think they're very special. Um, the truth is that like programming is less hard than uh, they make it seem. Uh, it just requires a lot of practice. So it's important. <laughs> Uh, it's important um, to look at uh, technology and and geospatial technology in particular as tool sets. Have you ever met a GIS person who says, I don't want to learn to code. I hate that I have to learn to code. I don't want to learn Python. I don't want to learn JavaScript. That's fine, but it's kind of like walking into a job site without a power drill. Like if you want to use a screwdriver for every single screw in that whole project, you totally can. It's just going to take you a really long time versus you know, bringing in a tool that uh, is more powerful. So there's like a symbiosis, I think, um, like a way that there, that uh, again, humility is a big important part of this, being able to say like, it's okay that you're an excellent programmer and you don't know what a map projection is. It's okay that you are a superstar GIS analyst and you don't know what an API is. Um, and we have to be like humble about um, and like open about the things that we don't know and learning together. Um, so yes, maps are special, spatial is special, but so is everything else. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, different tech. John, you showed particular enthusiasm about including uh, the Capital A Aboriginal community in this event. Uh, how can we make more space for indigenous mappers and indigenous mapping? Yeah, uh, great question. I think one thing that we could do is not schedule the conference on the same week as the Place 19, which is the, the Maori GIS yeah. uh, conference. Oops. <laughs> uh, so that's a whoops. But um, anyway, I think I think really it's about uh, creating relationships with organizations, uh, with indigenous organizations particularly, that are already doing this kind of work. Because they are doing this kind of work, we can support them. They can support us. Um, and and I, th I think it's really important for um, indigenous communities and indigenous organizations to be setting the tone for for what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really just about making friends, um, inviting them in, and figuring out what works for them. So we've got a few people here this week that can, that we can talk to about that. I think there's a birds of a feather today at lunchtime about um, yeah. Aboriginal mapping workshop. Um, and so I think just joining in those kinds of conversations and, and finding out uh, what the future looks like Great. from them. Yeah. Now, um, um, just tell me if this is out of line but you work for the Flemish, or you do volunteer with the Flemish GIS Association. Is that in any way relevant to this discussion? Uh, I'd like to defer. I learned I could do that. <laughs> uh, in, uh, no? I think it's very, no. no. Okay, I, well, <laughs> sorry, my fault, my bad. <laughs> and, and there, there's not a lot of history in Flanders, I, I relate this to history as well, and and recognize how, how to do that. Uh, is that may is, is that does that relate? If I relate it to history and and sure. how to uh, symbolize, and so maybe there's a relation to that. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from um, Anne or Lizzie? Not so much. 
I think John nailed the answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right, we have another another angle at the top here. So community building now involves lots of digital dot com channels. How to strike the balance in the mix? Uh, too few versus too many channels. The emailers versus the slacks versus the people that we got to write a fax to. Maybe you write a fax like that. You don't even do that, do you? <laughs> what do we do? How do we get that balance between you know communicating on too many channels versus leaving people out? Paul? IRC. <laughs> Does anybody still use IRC? For anything other than, oh no, IRC is not news groups. Anybody else use news groups for stuff that's not downloading? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> oh, and no comments on, we don't know how to communicate other than email. We're all digital natives, hey? I wouldn't say we're all digital natives. Um, the, uh, oh God, I lost my train of thought. Hold on. Uh, when you teach something to somebody, you have to teach it five or six ways to get everybody in the room to understand it. Yeah. Redundancy is important. Sharing information is like a one way communication is very different than facilitating a discussion. Uh, One-way communication can be replicated across many channels. There's no reason you can't send a Slack message and put something on IRC and send an email and put it on your website and put it on Twitter. Um, if you're trying to facilitate a discussion, that's a little bit more difficult, and it will require uh, active planning and extra planning and work. Um, if you hate Slack but your community organizes on Slack, you kind of have two options. You can either participate, well, I guess three. You can participate in Slack, even though you hate it, you can protest silently by not participating and then nobody knows how you feel, or you can make yourself, make your concerns known to the organizing group. And it's possible that you are one of 50 people and you are the only one who hates Slack. In that case, you know, feel free to, you know, dig your heels in and not move and not be a part of that discussion. But you, like those communities, like a community should be responsive to its members, so. Um, yeah, it may not be natural, but it is important that lots of people are included and by making things happen only in person or only via email can be like alienating to other groups of people. So um, do it, don't do it and don't say anything or say something and try to make it work for you. Kind of the three options there. And but maybe part of three is uh, uh, providing an alternative. As exactly, well. oh yeah, don't just complain, that's lame. Yeah. <laughs> you know, come in, come in and say, like, what if we use carrier pigeons or smoke signals or whatever? Um, or fax machines. Yep. I like that. Maybe start, like, a GoFundMe, like, get people to donate money so that you can individually buy each member of your community a fax machine. And then um, I think problem solved, right? Yeah. Yeah, done. Uh, so you can fax questions in. Next further questions, please. <laughs> so top question here. How can communities be used to influence decision makers in organizations that open source is safe and smart move forward? So how, how, can, we, can we work on communicating the value of open to our workplaces, to, I guess? So maybe that's a, like an inverse of the question before. How can individuals um, say to their bosses, this is a community I want to be in? Is there an opportunity there? Any decision makers in the room? Two. Hands up higher. So maybe that answers the question. You need to invite more decision makers. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Do we want them here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you, are, are they helpful in any way? <laughs> but I think that comes back to is open source the answer to everything? Is open standards the answer to everything? I don't think so. Uh, and you come, you know, in the OGC, we do bring together decision makers, policy makers, developers, students, you know, that's communities is not just like minded. Yeah. Same profile, yeah. same job description is decision makers need to be there because they make the decision to go left or right. Yeah. 
Um, I think even the question of whether it's a safe and smart move forward, you know, for a lot of us, it's it's it, the uh, the answer is like obvious. Yes, it is sure, but convincing your boss might be a different story. I think that um, uh, as this community grows, gains critical mass. Um, becomes more organized, has conferences like this one. I think it gains credibility, um, and I think, it, but I think asking the question is really good. Leader, you know, leaders can emerge from this community who can start answering that question more explicitly and yeah. um, point to things like this conference. Um, I guess that that's something we've been hearing from people in the Pacific a fair bit is that there's a lot of bias towards open source more so than I think that a lot of us experience in Australia, and New Zealand. Um, so taking it to the Pacific. I think can make a can you know, taking the conference to the Pacific can make big inroads there. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, um, finding ways to establish credibility as a community, I think, is important. Yeah. Well, there's one last question I'll go to, I think, and then I'll um, attempt to summarize, probably badly. But um, there's a question around any ideas about supporting community community members from Oceania who are not comfortable speaking English, and I think this is especially relevant. Um, as we move into the Pacific next year. So any ideas on how we can um, handle that? Um, somebody mentioned the other day um, of doing more translations of the software into non-English languages. I don't know if there are any in the Pacific already, like it's, if Q just has um, local language uh, translations, but it'd be really interesting to try to facilitate um, some of those kinds of projects moving forward. One of the reasons map time was able to be successful was because folks in other um, other countries, other places who wanted um, things in other languages decided as part of their community work, they were going to do translations. So we had map um, how to make a web map tutorial. It was very popular, and it got translated into both French and Spanish. Um, and uh, that was um, just the idea that you can do that uh, we created a springboard for other people to do that. Um, Miriam mentioned with uh, uh, GeoChicas that there are webinars are in Spanish and then also sometimes in English. Um, there are two Telegram channels for GeoChicas. One is in English, one is in Spanish. Um, and uh, some of it also can be helped by English speakers being more conscious of the language that they use, so that we use. So for example, if you use a lot of idioms or turns of phrase in your speech, have you ever tried to put any of those through Google Translate? Um, it doesn't make any sense. A really common one you see in tech blogging is take a gander, which is my least favorite, which makes no sense. Like you try to translate that, there's something about geese. It like doesn't make any <laughs> sense. So identifying, and I'm, I'm a, I'm not very good at this because I'm a fast talker, but speaking slowly, speaking clearly, being direct, um, paying attention to the way that you phrase things and uh, providing an environment where if there is on the fly translation happening, it's possible to do. Um, sentence construction is another one, but that's like a whole rabbit hole. I'm not gonna go down. Oh, rabbit hole, it's fun. All right, well, um, <laughs> we're, um, we're out of time. If we can just do a... Really, take a look. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll encourage you to take a gander next time. Um, if does anybody have like a brief sentence of closing that you'd like to wrap up with, or are we happy? Yeah. GeoGC has a specific fora uh, for a specific language, so we have the French OGC forum, we have the Spanish speaking. And, and I think that's really good because you can express yourself better in your native language. And, and you know, yeah. Right. Lo lose your egg, which is a, f a Dutch idiom, <laughs> in, in an easier way. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else with some closing comments? Well, look, I'm going to keep it really simple and just uh, say something that Lizzie said, which is the Akko. Everyone is a learner and everyone is a teacher. So thank you all for pushing your questions up. It's been fantastic and thank you very much to the panelists.